and welcome to the second scale lecture of 2023. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome two amazing scholars, Lina Salaimek, who is a British Academy Global Professor at Oxford University. And she's also a directrice d'études dans la section de séances religieuses à l'école pratique des hautes études. Yes. Um, and Ralph uh, Michaels, who is director of the Max Planck Institute for Private and Com Private International Cooperative Law in Hamburg. Um, Lina and Ralph will present a new project that they've been uh, working for working on for uh, a couple of years now, the decolonial comparative law project. Um, and given that the sustainable global economic um, law uh, uh, research project uh, within which this lecture is organized is an interdisciplinary um, group or a research project that gathers scholars from various disciplines, uh, private, public, international, uh, and some of us are also comparative lawyers. Um, I believe that many of us uh, have a lot to learn from the decolonial approaches that Lena and Ralph are proposing in this piece, among uh, many others, and that will help uh, illuminate how our respective uh, disciplines entrench or might entrench coloniality through their epistemolog epistemological assumptions and what can be done to address that. So Lina, Ralph, you have the floor for uh, 30, 40 minutes, and then we will have uh, around 40 minutes for the Q&A. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ivana, so much for <clears throat> the invitation. Sorry, we can't be there in person, which might have um, been very nice as well. I hope to see you in Amsterdam at some other point, very thrilled to see all the things that you're doing and building in Amsterdam. And thanks everybody for coming into this in the room or online. Very pleased about that as well. I hope you'll be uh, not completely displeased after this. We will share um, the presentation amongst the two of us, Lena and I. This is a joint project that indeed we've uh, been doing for a number of years now. Um, the presentation really rests largely on a paper and an article that we've already published in Rabe's Zeitschrift. Maybe some of you had a chance to read it before. And we convened before to discuss whether we should update it. We figured we should not update it for this presentation. Although, of course, the project has moved a little and our thinking has moved a little. But we think this provides a good basis maybe for, for discussion. And that's, and that's the hope what we can do. So this is a project that is called Decolonial uh, Comparative Law. And um, that means it tries to see how decoloniality can inform or should inform comparative law. So it's a project clearly about decolonial law, or decolonial theory and law, but it's also uh, specifically about the role of comparative law. And that I think is true is, is, is important to some extent. Both of us come from comparative law, at least in, 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 in part. In part, we do other things. And, and so part of the interest is to see what does the demand from decoloniality, what does it mean specifically for the discipline of comparative law? And we also think that that is a point that is at the same time somewhat underappreciated and of crucial importance for decolonial law in general. It seems underappreciated maybe because those who do comparative law tend to have endorsed post-colonial theory in general, but not so much decolonial theory. And also the overlap on the, from the other side from decolonial theory towards comparative law is not yet very great. And at the same time, comparative law as the discipline that really looks traditionally as at interrelations between legal orders and thereby also between communities and thereby also has its own specifically colonial history should be a discipline at the same time in great need of a decolonial analysis and with some promise perhaps uh, of a revival that can inform decolonial legal theory more generally. At least that's one hope 
behind the, behind the project. What we want to talk about today in the necessary brevity is first talk a little about conventional comparative law instead of just presenting a, an abstract um, stereotype. I'll try to run through a case study that may not be completely fitting, but may uh, show some of the relevant elements. Lena will talk about decolonial theory and decolonial legal studies. We'll then talk about what that implies for decolonial comparative law, and then also talk a little about the project that underlies this and what it involves and how it goes on and why you all should be interested and participate at some point. This is also an um, advertising event, of course, as all these events are. So let me start with comparative law, what is here called conventional comparative law and presentations like that are always stereotypes and this is going to be one as well, but maybe at least shows some elements of that. I would say that what we do under comparative law, under the heading of comparative law is typically three things. One is we compare legal systems, that is we look at uh, differences and similarities between legal systems and then we explain those or maybe we evaluate those. Secondly, we look at the influence of one legal system on another. And thirdly, we treat uh, comparative law as something of a basis of the understanding of global legal plurality, if you want, that is understand transnational law from a specifically comparative perspective. Now within that very broad definition, of course, there are numbers of uh, methodological approaches. I list three here on the left column, one formal or doctrinal comparative law, <clears throat> one a more culturalist comparison, one a more functionalist comparison. Um, and won't go into detail on those because those who know comparative law know what I'm referring to, and those who don't probably don't care enough to learn about it. There's lots of um, discussion within the field as between these and indeed other approaches and our hope is here to treat them all the same because they all share certain elements that we find to be problematic from a decolonial perspective. The most important approach in the second in the influence of one legal system on another is the discussion on legal transplants, the transplantation of legal rules or legal institutions or indeed entire legal systems from one society to another. And that of course has a particularly well-known colonial uh, history because a lot of the expansion of Western law, indeed European law to the rest of the world happened through legal transplant within colonization. And then the third element, uh, transnational law as a law that is not hierarchically uh, structured and ordered, but is fragmented and plural internally is the third part, if you want, that comparative law looks at or put differently traditional comparative law Try to overcome such fragmentation through legal unification. For some time, comparative law was at the service of legal unification. And by now, I think that aspiration has gone a bit to the background, but comparative law still looks at this plurality. And that's the third element within comparative law. Now, the example that I want to run through is not one uh, originally made by comparative lawyers, but by economists. And for that reason, possibly more fitting within the stereotypical view of comparative law than more savvy comparative lawyers would do. And for the same reason, I think demonstrates particularly well some of the promises and some of the shortcomings of such conventional comparative law. So the example is the Doing Business Project of the World Bank, started in 2004 and ended rather unceremoniously in 2020. And the hope was in this project to measure um, empirically, objectively, how uh, well prepared different countries in the world are for doing business. That is how attractive they are for investors in particular, how good they are as places in which you can do business. So that's an economic question, but of course it's a legal question in the background because the large part of the conditions that are measured in this context is in fact uh, legal rules and legal infrastructure in these respective countries. And so in that sense, this is a comparative law project. That started in 2004, it ended then in 2020 because it was found that um, there had been manipulation in the project. 
uh, in particular, China's data had been pushed up. And you can see on the left, uh, Global North, this is the New York Times report that uh, criticizes the World Bank for inflating China. On the right, you have a message from Africa that says the project was actually bad for people and planet altogether, and it's a good thing that it uh, ended. And so there are also different views on whether it should come back in a reformed way, which is what the World Bank plans at the moment, or whether it should be discarded altogether. I suggest that the decolonial perspective would say it should, dis should be discarded altogether. Um, but I have a little more to say about that in a moment. So what was this? Essentially, the attempt to measure this, this comes from an earlier project by economists who tried to define the, or measure the quality of legal systems, of legal orders, as a direct function of the institutional framework and thereby an indirect function of legal origin. Legal origin here describes its particular whether a um, legal system derived from common law or civil law. Um, the idea behind that was that we have random distribution between uh, countries in the global south, whether they were originally colonized by a civil law country or a common law country. Random distribution, of course, being the gold standard for natural experiments. And so you could measure whether the common law does better or the civil law does better. And all the economists researching this had gone to Chicago. And so they all measured that the common law does better, obviously. You can see here what's interesting for us is the intermediate step to say, what are the institutions that are shaped by common law versus civil law? Uh, the level of procedural formalism, judicial independence, which is considered to be high in a common law context and low in a civil law context, regulation of entry, et cetera, et cetera. And from there, we have certain um, outcomes that we can then measure. We measure those through indicators in this project, and then we see which legal rules lead to better outcomes. You can see already here that the only laws that are looked at here are really both uh, traditionally um, colonial laws, civil law, common law, both as external effects on these former colonies. And indeed, from the economist's perspective, that was the advantage to avoid endogeneity, to measure something that is clearly, or so they uh, argued at least, an, an independent variable that comes from the outside. So that's the background behind this. And that's why, we, why I suggest that this is really a comparative law project first and foremost. Uh, although it's done by economists, really what is being measured here is the impact of legal rules and institutions and legal origins on outcomes. So here you can see uh, the, the process in some more detail. I won't go into that. You can see there's a certain measure of indicators. We try to measure how many steps does it take, for example, to start a business? How uh, quickly, how easily can you get credit? At some point, it was also measured uh, how easily can you fire your employees? You see, can see that as the penultimate uh, measure here, flexibility in employment regulation. At some point, then the International Labor Organization protested and said, you can't give high points to a system that violates international labor standards. And so they uh, caved a little to that, but from an economic perspective, of course, that normativity would be irrelevant because the doing business would depend on how flexible are you and, and whether good labor standards are helpful to that or not would for the economist be a measure of, of something of measuring and not something of a normative, uh, normative commitment. So the promise here, and the promise is questionable, but the promise was that this is really empirical, objective and neutral and does not try to bring normativity into the measurements. Now, as I said, the legal origins in this project are entirely colonial. You can see that the entire world here um, really rests on English law, French law, German law, bizarrely Scandinavian law, and um, then a little bit of uh, socialist law. And so the entire world is a, um, um, a colonial fantasy <laughs> and the quality of legal systems is measured entirely as a function of that. It is not in the sense necessarily that therefore the uh, countries with um, a high, um, uh, with, with well, uh, how, how to put it, that rich countries would necessarily do better than, than poor countries. To some extent that is the case. You can see New Zealand, Singapore at the top, you can see Eritrea and Somalia at the bottom, and that clearly correlates with um, wealth. 
but otherwise it does not necessarily correlate with wealth nor with European um, origin. So New Zealand as a first world country does best, but the best improver here in 2017-18 indeed was Afghanistan. Um, slightly later that turned out to be not so good for doing business, obviously. But the hope here was indeed to measure this independently from learning. So you can see some surprises this. Georgia at six is not so surprising because the main economist in the project indeed was a sometime member of the Georgian government. So there's certainly correlation there. But you can see um, other surprises if you want. You can see, for example, Rwanda at 29 and France at 32. One of the many measures that created great protest in France because they said, how can it be that we do worse than uh, Rwanda does in this ranking? Rwanda, of course, a bit of a poster child in the law and development movement because of um, quite radical uh, reforms. Some of those clearly cater to this very ranking. But Rwanda therefore did very successfully. Of course, at the same time, if you think about this already, hardly anyone would say for most businesses, it's more attractive to do this in Rwanda than in France. So it's not completely clear whether this really measures what it um, purports to measure. Anyway, so these are the rankings and you see, can see some um, uh, tendencies in that common law tends to do better than, than, than civil law but very much also depends on individual countries. And that was the very hope of the project because the project hopes to give incentives to countries to reform their laws to do better in the rankings as all such rankings do. Um, now, of course, one correlation is, uh, of, uh, is also with wealth, although, as I said, not um, completely. Now, what's, what about the manipulations? As I said, the first one was really a manipulation to say we have to account somehow for labor standards. The second element of manipulation that did not bring the project down was the fact that Chile does better or worse in the rankings, regardless of the numbers, depending on whether they have a socialist or a conservative uh, government. You can see that on the left, they changed their indicators depending on um, whether uh, there was a socialist government or not. Uh, the real one that brought the project down then was uh, the Ch China measurement. China kept falling in the rankings and complained and said, we will actually withdraw financing of the World Bank if we don't do better. And so the project said, uh, let's see how we do about that. First, we could incorporate Hong Kong and Taiwan, but that seemed politically a little risky. Uh, not surprisingly, then they said, why not only measure the economic powerhouses like Beijing and Shanghai? And then someone pointed out, then you'd have to do that for all other countries in the world as well. And who knows what comes out of that? And so in the end, they said, let's just cook the indicators to see that we somehow managed to get China back on track. So they did that, but that came out and then the whole um, project was scrapped. And so from the project of reformers, they'd say, well, that's unfortunate. We should have a different one that does not emphasize so much. There's more objective that works indicators in that are um, not as easy to manipulate, maybe also downplay a little the rankings and uh, go more into um, qualitative comparison, but really from a um, decolonial perspective, uh, much of that would be insufficient to come back to that at the end. So what can we see in this? How is this conventional comparative law and what are shortcomings? One is the prioritization of formalized law over other forms of social ordering. That is, the project has an inbuilt uh, priority for official law over unofficial law as what it measures and as what it considers the uh, cause for doing business attractivity. That is uh, state law as opposed to non-state law, state institutions as opposed to non-state institutions. Secondly, in the measurements, and this is something that we find in comparative law more generally, we have methodological nationalism. It is the entity that is measured. The object that is measured is mostly the state. As you've seen in the rankings before, what is being measured here are states, despite the huge differences that exist within states on the one hand, and the fact, on the other hand, that in some of these, what we find is that success, economic success, happens through agglomeration of states, or indeed happens at certain points where different states border on each other. So that's something that doesn't come in in the measurement. From a comparative law perspective, one reason is because most official law is state law. And so the area that is governed by that law is the state, is the territorial state. And that's why from a comp traditional comparative law perspective, that's the um, attractive object of measurement uh, from a 
non-juridical perspective, it's not at all clear why you'd focus on states as opposed to something else. Within that is then thirdly the shortcoming of assumed homogeneity within legal traditions. You think of doctrinal comparative law, that's obvious because you look at the, um, the rules of uh, Dutch law as governing anywhere in the Netherlands, regardless of how they play out differently locally. But we see that also in functionalist comparative law, which looks at uh, legal rules as responses to challenges, as responses to problems in society, but the solutions are national because they're national laws. And for that reason, the problems are also used as, as um, national problems, as local problems. And even culturalist comparative law that tries to explain, I'm simplifying here, comparative, tries to explain legal rules as consequences of a culture tends to view culture as something national. Dutch law is a consequence of Dutch national culture. So again, in all of those three approaches, we have this methodological nationalism that leads to this homogeneity. So those three are traditional criticisms of traditional comparative law. The fourth one that comes in is the at least implicit superiority of the global north. You saw before, it's not directly so in the rankings themselves. Global south countries can do better in this, but they do better only if they adopt this particular epistemology that comes from a northern idea of the law. So Rwanda rises up in the rankings because it complies with these kinds of demands that are themselves the demands uh, of global northern epistemologies, global northern law. That's one shortcoming there. A second that we find in the idea of legal transplants and also in the doing business reports is the idea that the transplant of legal rules from one system to another is really one from between separate entities, as opposed to seeing those as happening within one particular transnational social field within a certain elite within which this, uh, these legal rules travel quite freely. And then thirdly, the global south is exoticized or normalized in the typical dual move, either exoticized as those areas that do not comply with the demands of a modern economy and for that reason have to stay back, Eritrea, Somalia, or normalized in the sense that we measure them exactly in the same way as we measure northern systems and that says we find them successful the more they are like France or more importantly the more they are like the United States. So so much in a nutshell as some of the shortcomings that we identify and now I'll give to Lena. Okay, so now I'm gonna to try to share my screen and hope that this works. Uh, you never know with these things. I can also share mine if you can. No, I think it's, it's working, right? You can see it? Yep. Great, so I'm going to now try to talk very briefly. Actually, Ivana, do you know how much time we have left? If you have a sense of the time, that would be great, Ivana. I don't know if she's keeping time. In any case, I want to just sort of uh, briefly go over decolonial theory and decolonial legal studies and emphasize that in our project, we're not interested in the kind of rhetorical blah, blah, blah that often happens in academia about critical theory or decoloniality. And we're really much more interested in showing concrete case studies and in actual applications of decoloniality because there's far too much noise, I think. So coloniality is a mode of thought that legitimizes colonialism and neocolonialism while espousing universalism. This means that coloniality is, sorry, not limited to colonized regions. That means it exists in both colonial centers or colonized or formerly post-colonial regions. It eradicated many subaltern epistemology and it marks epistemologies from the global south as inadequate or antiquated. Briefly then, coloniality is epistemological power that resembles and reinforces colonial hierarchies. Here, the main issue is that when we talk about coloniality, we're talking about a way of thinking. We're not only talking about something like uh, the end of colonial power in in the sense of decolonization or colonialism and then decolonialism. And related to this, it's very important to differentiate between Western Eurocentric and colonial. 
the fact that something began in the West doesn't necessarily mean that it's colonial. The fact that something might be Eurocentric does not necessarily mean that it's colonial. So we want to be very careful in the ways that we use these categories throughout the project. The main uh, idea that is important among decolonial thinkers is that coloniality produces a certain myth about modernity, and the myth of modernity elevates the global north by ignoring contemporaneous and intertwined colonialism, meaning that this story about the ascendancy of Europe in the modern era ignores the genocide of more than 60 million indigenous peoples in the 16th century with beginnings of colonization. And therefore, from the perspective of many decolonialists, modernity is a periodization category that requires a lot of time. Uh, somebody could just mute. Yes, thank you. So modern, modernity is then a periodization category that refers to a block of time, often dated as beginning around the 16th century. And as a result of theory or decolonialist view the historical period of decolonization as ushering in neocolonialism rather than ending colonialism. Thus, that era that is often referred to in the literature as decolonization in the mid 20th, that presumably ended in the mid 20th century, isn't actually decolonization from the perspective of decolonialists. It's actually a transformation or a shifting point from colonialism to neocolonialism. So I, I don't want to get into the details of all this because I've, uh, it's a bit complicated, but I just want to briefly say that we're developing ways of thinking about how coloniality, coloniality affects law specifically, using comparative law as a means of seeing patterns across different legal traditions and systems. And so when we look at coloniality's effect on various parts of the world, we can start to make some uh, identifications of patterns that coloniality is an ideology that converts states by converting them into uh, modern nation states, meaning by framing states as only possible in the form of the modern nation state we have, uh, changes traditions into religions and converts law into positive law by making it almost impossible to conceptualize law as anything other than state law. And I should say on the second point that when I use the word religion, that can, in a global context, easily be uh, substituted with the term native law or customary law or a lot of the other kinds of colonial constructions that fit into this structure of seeing the pre-modern colonized society's practices as fitting within a particular framework. So once we recognize the colonial power of the myth of modernity, we should delink from Eurocentrism. And that means we should, once we recognize also the effects of coloniality, we, our next option, our next step is to try to delink. Delinking means recognizing that there are options to Eurocentrism and that there are options to universalism, that the world that we live in isn't the only world that we can imagine. Now, keeping a distance does not mean discarding, uh, this is sorry, a quote from Bonavero de Sousa Santos to emphasize that anti-colonial does not mean anti-Western. Keeping a distance does not mean discarding the rich Eurocentric critical tradition and throwing it into the dustbin of history, thereby ignoring the historical possibilities of social emancipation in Western modernity. It means rather including it in a much broader landscape of epistemological and political possibilities. It means exercising a hermeneutic suspicion regarding its foundational truths by uncovering what lies below their face value. It means giving special attention to the suppressed or marginalized smaller tradition within the big Western tradition. So on that latter point, that would mean emphasizing the heterodoxy rather than the orthodoxy of uh, the Western tradition. This then leads us to pluriversality. When we recognize the myth of modernity, when we recognize the implications of coloniality, and we attempt to delink from Eurocentric universalism, this results in us seeing that there are multiple ways of being and knowing in the world. There are multiple approaches, there are multiple understandings of law, state, and practice or tradition, and that is pluriversality. 
So decoloniality exposes the epistemic assumptions of coloniality. It rejects coloniality's construction of national, racial, ethnic, sorry, there's a typo there, gender and religious classifications as universal categories. Decoloniality is concerned with recognizing and strengthening epistemologies from the global South that managed to survive colonialism, as well as developing anti-colonial epistemologies from any region. And I would add, as well as developing decolonial epistemologies from any region, because I would differentiate between anti-colonial and decolonial. So thus far, decolonial legal studies have primarily contributed to international law, constitutional law, and philosophy of law. In addition, decolonial theory illuminates the dynamics of law and gender and law and religion. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the details of uh, decolonial legal studies today. There is a section in our article that is a literature review that tries to summarize the basic points. Uh, so you can refer to the article, basically. So as we mentioned earlier, as Ralph mentioned earlier, there are certain shortcomings in the Doing Business Report that uh, demonstrates certain points that we wanted to make about conventional comparative law, four points that Ralph summarized before, they're on the screen. And there are ways we feel that decolonial theory can help respond to those shortcomings. So whereas conventional comparative law involves a prioritization of formalized law, a decolonial or a proof reversal comparative law perspective integrates non-formal law. Whereas conventional comparative law is focused on methodological nationalism, decolonial comparative law recognizes and appreciates non-state law. Whereas conventional comparative law assumes homogeneity within legal traditions and systems, decolonial comparative law replaces homogeneity with plurality. And whereas conventional comparative law implies superiority of the global north, decolonial comparative law insists on giving voice to epistemologies of the global south. So we based on uh, several case studies that we've each worked on separately and together, we've identified certain signposts for decolonial comparative law. We would suggest that decolonial comparative law examines relationships of power between legal systems and traditions, rather than focusing so much on so-called similarities and differences of a legal system and traditions. Second, law, we would, second point, we would emphasize that modern law cannot be presumed to be superior to pre-colonial legal traditions. We should distrust methodologies and epistemologies that make the superiority of modern law unavoidable. And third, decolonial comparative law requires a broader definition of law that incorporates non-state law, but not as a mere mirror image of state law, but rather as an understanding that law is itself a pluriversal concept. And finally, that Decolonizing comparative law means transcending conventional legal families and narrow understandings of law by moving beyond the kinds of cultural particularities approach that groups legal traditions within pre-existing, pre-conceptualized categories. So with that, uh, we just want to make mention of two of our upcoming events. The first is the Decolonial Comparative Law Summer School, which will be happening in July in Hamburg. Unfortunately, the deadline for applying to the summer school has already passed, but we expect that we are going to be having comparative law, decolonial comparative law summer schools on a regular basis. So if you are interested, if this is something uh, that you think you would like to participate in, please send an email to the Decolonial Comparative Law Project, which is decolonial at mpipriv.de, which is on our website, and add yourself to the mailing list so that you can get information about the next summer school. The summer school will be focusing on bringing together comparative law and decoloniality with rigorous attention to methods. I'm actually quite obsessive about methods. <laughs> and the Institute will offer some needs-based scholarships for physical attendance to a limited selection of participants, uh, both this summer and in future projects. And we've thus far organized two decolonial comparative law workshops. The first one was supposed to be in South Africa, but because of the pandemic took place virtually. And it was broadly on decolonial comparative law. And the second one took place in Oxford last September, and it was on decolonial and pre-colonial comparative legal history. Our third workshop will be on decolonial comparative property law. It will be sometime in 2024. We uh, have not set the exact date, but we will soon. It will be taking place in Brazil. And again, if you're interested in 
submitting a paper because we do a call for papers, uh, which will be out in the next few months. So if you think you would be interested in submitting a paper, please sign up to our mailing list so that you'd be informed about the call for papers and be able to submit and hopefully participate. There are also additional opportunities to participate in the Decolonial Comparative Law Project through residents at the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg. There are opportunities for PhD students and short-term visiting fellows, again, see our website. And with all of that, this is our website, by the way, with all of that advertising done, thank you for listening, and we look forward to your questions.